All right. Welcome, everyone, to the next event in our webinar series. Uh, this will be a presentation by guest speaker, Professor John Bowers, on silicon photonic integrated circuits. My name is Garrett Cole. I'm the technology manager at Thor Labs Crystalline Solutions in Santa Barbara, California. And as an alumnus of Professor Bowers Research Group, I take great pleasure in moderating today's webinar. Um, John holds Fred Cobley Chair in Nanotechnology and is Director of Institute for Energy Efficiency and a distinguished professor in the Department of Departments of Electrical and Computer Engineering, as well as Materials at UC Santa Barbara. John received his MS and PhD degrees from Stanford University and worked for AT&T Bell Laboratories in Honeywell before joining UCSB. Uh, John is a serial entrepreneur and co-founder of Nexus Photonics, Quintessent, Orion, Arius Photonics, Terabit Technology, and Calient Networks. Furthermore, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Inventors, and is a fellow of uh, AAAS, IEEE, OSA, and the American Physical Society. He's a recipient of the IEEE Photonics Award, OSA IEEE Tyndall Award, the OSA Holoniak Award, IEEE Leos Williams Schreifer Award, EE Times Annual Creativity and Electronics Award for Most Promising Technology, and the South Coast Business and Technology Pioneer and Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. So, Following all those accolades uh, throughout John's talk, please feel free to submit any questions you have using the Q&A tool. And John will be answering these questions following the presentation. So this time, I'd like to hand off to John, and I very much look forward to this presentation. Great. Thank you, Garrett. That's a very nice introduction. I'm glad to sort of describe the excitement and all the new advances that are happening with silicon photonic integrated circuits. It's really a very exciting time. And, and next week at OFC, there'll be lots of presentations that uh, we made in this general field. I want to acknowledge that the students uh, listed here that did a lot of this work. And a lot of the work uh, was also done by Lin Chang, who's also a professor now. And I want to acknowledge these professors in particular, Carrie Valhalla at Caltech, and uh, Paul Morton, Galen, and Dan at UCSB, and Frank and Scott at, at NIST. Um, and I want to thank DARPA, MTO, particularly Gordon Keeler, for uh, supporting this research. So as an outline, I'll talk first what's driving silicon photonic integrated circuits, the, the really high volume applications. And I'll talk about the different ways to integrate lasers with the rest of the photonic integrated circuit. And then some of the big advances that are happening as a result of using silicon, um, namely narrow lines lasers in, in particular. And uh, talk a bit about comb generation conclusion and then, you know, this, this picture here summarizes what we're talking about here, which is integrating lasers, say, with ring resonators to make comb generators. And uh, that's a very, you know, successful way to, to make, you know, tens of thousands of, of comb sources at one time. And as you'll see, there's a lot of applications of that. So this particular picture was shown in, in science uh, by Chao Zhang. So, this slide illustrates the advantage of using silicon, namely the large area substrates. You can make much bigger circuits. In some cases, like optical gyroscopes, that matters because the enclosed area is what determines the sensitivity. Um, but you can see here, compared to these other, you know, smaller compound semiconductor source weight wafers, you're really much better off with with large diameter uh, silicon. Um, the big advantage here of using low loss of silicon is using low loss waveguides, you know, literally 10th dB per meter, and we'll see the impact of that. And we can now make better lasers on silicon than you can on native substrates. But of course, a lot of the motivation for this has always been cheaper substrates, the ability to, to scale to higher volume, more advanced processing. So again, lower loss waveguides because of better lithography. And then advanced packaging and, and 3D integration of electronics and photonics together. We'll talk about that. Um, these are some of the, the high volume applications uh, for silicon photonics. And uh, certainly Datacom Telecom is the big one that's driving the field right now. Uh, but also LiDAR, right? If, if we end up having uh, gyroscopes and, and other sensors on automotive platforms that, that quickly scales to you know, hundreds of millions of chips very quickly. Uh, and again, we like to go from non-integrated you know, uh, optical gyroscopes to integrated with, with waveguides. We'd like to work in the visible and look at, you know, AR, VR applications. And I'll talk a little bit about optical quantum computing and then, uh, you know, a variety of biosensors uh, for this. So they're all, you know, very tens of millions of applications very quickly and, you know, scale very quickly is very important. Uh, 
Um, so the point is that uh, there's, you know, applications in communications, navigation, sensing. Right now, in the case of communications, silk photonics are making, you know, millions of units per year. Transceivers are now, you know, a very successful application of of silicon photonics. And when we say silicon, we really mean the substrate is silicon. The waveguide might be silicon, but it might also be gallium arsenide or silicon nitride or some other waveguide. We'll talk a lot about that today. Um, if you look at the uh, growth of this field scientifically, it's growing very fast. You know, we're now at something like 6,000 papers per year in silicon photonics. And if you look at the recent conferences, there's now lots and lots of papers, which you know, 10 years ago, that was not the case at all. And uh, these, this data for OFC is for the last OFC. There, there'll be even more this year. Um, so the point is that we really are in the midst of a silicon photonics revolution. The datacom application is the biggest one today, and we're seeing this transition from, you know, the the switching chips and memory chip processor chips are, are silicon, and all of the optics are on these pluggable units uh, that are typically made of thinium phosphide or gallium arsenide, to evolving to where the optics are on board. So now we get more and more data. We we don't want to, you know, have to go to higher data rates, and consequently. We don't want to have the losses associated with these long copper transmission lines. And then going to co-packaged optics, which is where the field is today. Two and a half D co-packaged optics moving towards 3D, where the photonics you know, and, and the electronics are, are mounted on top of each other. And uh, so again, you get very high density uh, connections. And eventually that'll, that'll move towards you know, co-packaged optics with in integrated lasers. And uh, here's a picture. In the bottom here of, of one of Broadcom's chips, of what one of these co-packaged, and, and you know today it's at 50 terabit per second chips, and so the uh, photonic chips are now you know 3.2 terabits. So the growth uh, and amount of integration required is, is growing very very rapidly. Here's a picture from OIF of of you know the way they envision a 51 terabit switch, which again is where we are today this year. And in you know two years we'll be at 100 terabits, and after that, 200 terabits. And so, uh, the modules today are 3.2 terabits. So if it's 100 gigabit per wavelength, that's you know 32 wavelengths. That's very high amounts of of integration. Either lots of parallel fibers or lots of parallel wavelengths. Um, and uh, our own work um, is involved heterogeneous integration, and we developed this about 15 years ago and transferred it to Intel. And they're very successful with a heterogeneous silicon platform. So this is one example of a number of products they have. This is a 100G CWDM. They also make uh, PAM4, they make 200G, 400G, 800G. And you can see the, the large amounts of, of integration here where you have four lasers, monitor photodiodes, uh, modulators, um, and a multiplexer all you know, integrated together. And again, the big advantage of this outside of, you know, cost and volume and size and, and lower power consumption is better reliability. So the data in the field for these transceivers, you know, is almost 20 times better than, uh, you know, discrete gallium arsenide or phosphide based chips. And so integration really is a big advantage uh, for reliable uh, operation and, and, and low cost. Um, our own work at UCSB, uh, we have a project in the DARPA pipes project, and so it's very much along the same thing where we have, you know, uh, comb sources. So in this case, 20 wavelengths. It's a mode lock laser. I'll talk about other ways to make comb sources shortly, and then each of those feeds, uh, each of those wavelengths, a particular ring resonator. So these ring resonators are aligned to the comb lines of this mode lock laser and uh, gets transmitted over an optical fiber and the receive, the same thing happened, but it's demultiplexed. And these are chips made in, in Ames, uh, 300 millimeter silicon foundry. And uh, then we bond electrical ICs to the, to the surface of this uh, to drive all those ring resonators. So again, the density here is very high. The pad pitch is you know, small, it's 36 micron pitch. And, uh, the big advantage here is that the electrical drivers and the and the modulators are you know just a few microns apart, 
and consequently, you don't have all the losses of 50 ohm transmission lines and and things like that. And uh, so, that's that's one example. Um, the comb source is key. This is what we're using. So th in this case, it's a mode lock laser source. So fairly low thresholds, um, you know, fairly good wall plug efficiency, and very flat combs. So you can get in this case 20 wavelengths that are within a few dB of each other, and not very much information data being transmitted outside of that or, or, or power going to outside of that. So the big advantage of quantum dot mode locking is the higher four-way mixing in quantum dots, about 10 times higher than quantum wells, allows for very good mode locking. And you can even get self-mode locking where there's no saturable absorber. But the other big advantage of quantum dots is the lower line width enhancement factor. And this results in, in much reduced reflection sensitivity. I'll, I'll give one example of that later. But typically, 40 dB less sensitivity. So you don't need to integrate an isolator, which is kind of the difficult thing. And if you look at a company like Quintessent, they're making quantum dot uh, lasers integrated with uh, you know, these, these re resonator arrays, and um, it works quite well. Here's a recent paper in Nature that uh, uh, we published with Lin Chang and, and the group at, at Peking University. It's a different way of generating combs. So now we're using nonlinear gallium arsenide, and I'll show more about that in a second, uh, pumped by a DFB laser. Either for Datacom, in this case, this is based on oxender arrays, uh, rather than ring resonator arrays, but uh, for data transmission, but also then for microwave photonics or for, for LiDAR chip optical ranging uh, or, or for neural networks. And so it's uh, a lot of different applications of, of these comb sources, and it's an area where silicon photonics really excels. So how do you integrate the laser with the, with the rest of the silicon photonic integrated circuit? We use all four approaches shown here. Certainly, most of the work today is based on off-chip lasers that are just fiber coupled to silicon photonics. Um, but increasingly, as one gets higher, needs higher density, uh, hybrid integration where the, the chips are adjacent to each other. And then the process that I showed from Intel, heterogeneous integration, where three five wafers are bonded to silicon wafers and the lasers are, are integrated. So, you know, literally you're making tens of thousands of lasers on every wafer. and uh, this is certainly the highest volume, lowest cost uh, approach. Um, and ultimately moving towards monolithic integration where the epitaxial material is grown on the silicon directly. And I'll show that in the next couple of slides. This is the sort of the least, uh, it's not ready for commercial application yet. It's the, it's the most advanced, um, but it's moving very rapidly. Heterogeneous is, is being used today by, by Intel and off-chip and hybrid is used by a, a lot of different companies. So quantum dot lasers were proposed, you know, long time ago by uh, Professor Arakawa, and uh, first demonstrated back in the mid '90s. And you know, the lower thresholds that you get with quantum dots is one of the reasons that it was of interest. Also, the higher temperature operation. Um, but what really drives it today, in my mind, is that quantum dots are much more reliable than quantum wells. And uh, there's a lot of subtle physics in terms of why that is, but. If you want to grow epitaxially on silicon, there's enough defects there that I'm convinced, at least at 1310, it will be done by quantum dots. And you can see that here. This is the lifetime that's been de de demonstrated anywhere in the world with quantum wells, and the maximum is only 400 hours. Whereas with quantum dots, now you can get upwards of, of uh, 10 or 100 million hours uh, lifetime. And that's shown here. As you reduce the dislocation density, you get longer and longer lifetime. Uh, and uh, the most recent results are shown here, where you get actually quite good lifetime, even at high temperature operation, uh, aging at 80 degrees C. This shows a lot of detail of, of, of how that was achieved. We don't need to go into it here, but um, the point being that as you reduce the dislocation density, as you put in filters and strain super lattices, you can now get to quite good lifetimes, even at high temperatures. And you can see in this lower right picture that degradation uh, is, is relatively minimal. Um, so uh, the most recent work in that area is uh, shown here. And so we've been growing, uh, we, we developed the MBE growth process at UCSB, we've transferred it to IQE. And so they're growing uh, on 300 millimeter wafers. And these lasers have, you know, puts out a lot of power, you know, this shows 70 milliwatts 
We've seen up to, to you know, 120 milliwatts at wider waveguides. Blazing up to 60 in this case, we've seen up to 120 degrees. Um, and uh, so uh, it's very exciting. And uh, so again, this is part of the Lumos, DARPA Lumos project. And uh, the most recent work now, we're uh, growing these in pockets. So not originally we did it on planar sur surfaces, now we're growing it in pockets. And that's because we need to get the, the quantum dot region you know, aligned vertically with the silicon nitride or silicon waveguides that we're coupling to. And so um, this shows some of the most recent results. So again, it's all on 300 millimeter wafer. And uh, SUNY is now offering this uh, tentatively uh, to the first group uh, multi-project wafer runs using this in integrated technology. So that's monolithic, uh, that's developing. The main issues there, yet our reliability is not quite where it needs to be. And coupling to waveguides is not quite where it needs to be. Heterogeneous integration, though, is what you know Intel has been demonstrating, and uh, uh, it works very well. It allows one to combine a lot of different technologies. You can have a variety of, of waveguides, maybe silicon or silicon nitride to get very low loss, perhaps very nonlinear waveguides, algas or lithium navate, perhaps magnetic materials, and then a variety of active regions. Um, it could be silicon modulators or silicon germanium modulators or indium them arsenic phosphide modulators with gain regions that are typically, you know, indium phosphide for 1.5 or 1.3, gallium arsenide for 1.3, and then gallium right or, or, you know, shorter wave like eight, 800 nanometer, I'll show in a second. Um, but also gallium nitride now to get into the visible. And so we combine all these technologies together on one wafer and, uh, this is one example of some work that Joel Guo has done in my group. And uh, uh, this combined, uh, you know, gain regions that are, you know, around the 1300 nanometer region with uh, gain regions in the E band, as well as then C band, S band, L band uh, devices together. And so, again, you bond multiple pieces at one time. We can now fill the entire low loss, you know, window of optical fiber with chips uh, and that'll be needed. So that was heterogeneous integration. This slide sort of just summarizes combining uh, hybrid heterogeneous integration together. And uh, this is a project we had again at DARPA, um, project to make an optical synthesizer. And so some of the devices like the, the pump lasers and tunable lasers were heterogeneously integrated and then hybrid integrated chips next to each other. By hybrid, I mean chips that are placed, you know, adjacent to other chips uh, to combine different functionality together. And so it may be uh, uh, the, the piplin or, or gallium arsenide 2F generation. Um, and in this case, we're able to make an optical synthesizer. And the final package is shown here. So it's relatively small, combining a lot of different technologies together. And uh, uh, this is sort of the overall structure of it. So again, you have a, uh, a pump laser that, that you know, pumps a, a comb, and this was made by Lysentech, and uh, that generates uh, an octave of frequencies, and then we, we combine that with either piplin or gallium arsenide, uh, second harmonic generators, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and again, by self-referencing that, you can get accurate frequency uh, determination. And so this shows one example of that, uh, where um, you're able to step the laser in steps of, you know, subhertz. Uh, and you can do that across all 50 nanometers. So across 65 gigahertz, you can move the laser in one hertz steps. So that's sort of the ultimate exa example of what could be done with hybrid and heterogeneous integration on silicon. So again, silicon is always the substrate. The waveguide might be silicon, but the waveguide might be uh, gallium arsenide or silicon nitride. And uh, uh, the advantages are shown here. In Indian phosphide waveguides typically have fairly high losses, a dB per centimeter, gallium arsenide may be a little lower. Silicon is lower, 10th dB, maybe 0.01 dB per centimeter. But silicon nitride is the real winner here, right? You can get down to 0.001 dB per centimeter, make very, very high Q resonators. And uh, that's certainly important in the infrared wavelengths, but it's also very important in the visible wavelengths uh, where silicon is absorbing. 
And uh, obviously, as you go shorter, below 400 nanometers, then silicon nitride becomes absorbing. So let's look at one application of these low-loss silicon waveguides, and that results in making very narrow line with lasers. And so this summarizes the, the trend that we've seen that with, on indiphosphide substrates, line widths have gone down over the years. Uh, and the, most recently, the narrowest line with lasers are, are quantum bat based, and that's because they uh, have you know, effectively zero line with enhancement factor. Um, and most of the structures are using these grading structures, these segmented grading DBR structures. But on silicon now, we're seeing a much more rapid advance. So as we use silicon nitride or silicon oxynitride, hybrid integrated in blue or heterogeneously integrated in green, uh, which is, you know, lags by a couple of years. It's a little more complicated, but more scalable. Um, we're now seeing line with, you know, intrinsic line with, of, you know, 40 millihertz. And, and what's going on there is simply that the, this formula for the shallow towns for line width, uh, as you get lower loss, you get higher Qs. And so you expect to get these uh, narrower line widths. Um, so again, you know, we, we're grateful to, to Thor Labs for supplying many, many tunable lasers. They, they tend to be relatively bulky, but perform extremely well. We're now looking at basically, can we get uh, by integration uh, down here, a very narrow line width uh, and, and very, very low cost and, and size as well. And uh, so that's really on the horizon. So this slide summarizes the progress that we've made over the last decade. And uh, we've gone through a variety of structures as shown in the center here. Uh, down to the, the sort of one at the bottom. I'll show here more detail in a second. Um, and lineups have come down, you know, from you know, megahertz or hundreds of kilohertz down to, you know, just, just 120 hertz. And that's primarily because the losses of the waveguides have come down over that time. And uh, so again, a few words on line width. Um, what I'm talking about there is what, you know, the, the Lorentzian line with also called the fundamental line with their instantaneous or shallow talent line with, but that's, you know, the white noise floor. So that's the high frequency noise that you, that you measure and that's uh, sort of the fundamental limit. But typically at lower frequencies, there's, there's much higher noise and that's due to, you know, a lot of environmental aspects, uh, vibrations, thermal fluctuations. And, and so that uh, means the integrated line width is larger than, than that fundamental number. And uh, so, we're working on all these aspects, and I'll show some really exciting results in terms of integrated line widths of just one hertz or left. Um, we made a lot of progress in basically reducing the high frequency noise by reducing the thermal refractive noise and the rest of these sources as, as shown here. So again, uh, we're using a variety of effects. The, the laser itself, uh, by itself, we're working on higher Q cavities. We'll talk about that in a second. But also there's a variety of extended cavity effects and the line width goes down by F squared, and F has two terms to it. Uh, one is due to just the extended cavity that you get, and the other is due to the negative feedback that occurs in these cavities, which is a very interesting phenomenon that uh, Bahala and uh, Henry and or even Karzenov, you know, predicted many years ago, and we now see it in spades. So to reduce the line width of just the solitary laser, we need higher Qs. We need to reduce the, the waveguide loss. And so we go to structures that are much like uh, Paul Jujakas has pioneered with so-called skull structure, where most of the energy is in these, these waveguides shown in the red. And uh, that allows us to push the line was down dramatically. Um, but the other effect then is to have these, you know, extended ring resonators that, that filter out a particular line with, but they're very high Q and have, you know, very long effective line width. Literally, the laser may only be one millimeter long, but the effective length is seven or eight millimeters or even a centimeter long. And uh, the second effect then is this uh, negative optical feedback. So basically, we don't operate the laser on the center of the, of the resonance, but rather we detune to one side where you get negative feedback. On the other side, you get positive feedback. And so on the negative side, if there's a spontaneous emission event that uh, kicks you, um, say to the to the right, so the the frequency goes up, reflectivity goes up, photon density goes up, carry density goes down, refractive index goes up, and so it kicks it back the other way, and uh, keeps you in a stable. 
viewpoint. And uh, so the sum of these two effects is, is not small. You know, this factor F can be on the order of 10. So F squared is 100. And uh, this set of slides shows that as we detune the laser on one side, the noise goes down, as shown here. And then as we detune the other side, the noise goes up. And uh, so this has to be taken into account when designing and operating these structures. And you can see this a little better. This slide shows this uh, F factor. And uh, again, it, it goes from you know, being above one to below one, depending upon whether you tune one side or the other of the resonance. And you see the same effect then of the line width um, as being higher or lower. And so uh, we use this in, uh, in spades. So let's look a little more at these, these structures. So these lasers have a gain section. There's a, a phase tuner to get on residence of the cavity. There's an output coupled mirror. We use these loop mirrors. And if this coupler right here is adjustable, we can change the output coupling from 0 to 100%, basically. <clears throat> and on the other side, we have rings. We have two rings that are slightly different diameter to get an interferometric effect. And you can see that here. Um, we adjust the two radii such that the close-in modes are suppressed by you know, at least 3 dB. So again, that's the reflectivity such that when it's in a cavity, then it'll lay single mode with you know, 50 or 60 dB or more side mode suppression. And then at some point, this, this goes back and comes back in phase again. And you want that where it comes in phase to be outside the, the gain width of the semiconductor. And so this shows an example. It's a simple two-ring cavity, and you can tune across 40 nanometers. And the tuning map is very clean, right? As you tune one resonator or the other, it steps across this. And the laser puts out reasonable powers. It's got a very nice Li curve. Um, so as you tune one of the rings, you get you know, you, the, the cavity hops from one to the next mode. And the step can be adjusted, obviously, by the difference in radii. But you know, typically, you might want to make it 100 gigahertz. Uh, in this case, this particular laser, it ends up being 1.7 nanometers. Um, and then there's also cavity uh, mode locking, or mode hopping. And uh, in this case, uh, you know, it tunes continuously, you know, about 2 tenths of a nanometer. Uh, Paulo Pintus in my group has just written a very nice paper about how to increase this. I'm looking at getting you know, above 1 nanometer continuous tuning widths. Again, this laser has fairly nice frequency noise and fairly nice line width, just uh, you know, a couple of kilohertz um, across this entire wavelength band. So that's you know, sort of how do you get a kilohertz line width. How do you get well below that? And uh, to do that, we need to get lower waveguide losses. So down here, this is 0.1 dB per centimeter. We can, we can do that now. And, uh, and we expect then, therefore, to get line widths that are you know, so much smaller on the, on the order of, of 40 hertz. So we end up making lasers with a variety of waveguides. Some of them are the strip waveguides, where the uh, bend radius is very small, so we make sharp bends in, in the structure. Other regions where the gain section is uh, uh, are maybe a shallow etched ridge. But then to get the really high Q, the really low loss waveguides, it's a very shallow edge ridge. And this now has a lot of micro bend loss. And so these diameters are actually quite large. And so that makes a change in the design spectrum needed. So you can see here, these are two of these rings, just like before. But now, because the radii are quite large, the, the mode spacing is very close together. You get multiple modes that are, are almost the same reflection, reflectivity. And so that doesn't work well. You get mode hopping uh, and, and, and multi-mode behavior. So we go to three ring cavities, in this case, or even four ring cavities. And now you can suppress those adjacent modes, and again, have a very high Q cavity, and you can push the, where it comes back in resonance outside the gain width of the semiconductor. And uh, here's another example of it. Paul Morton's worked on, on ways and, uh, to, to, to push those down. And the laser ends up looking like this. So the three rings are shown in the structure. There, there's the gain region here, phase tuner then the output coupler here. And uh, this shows a picture of what it actually looks like. And again, showing quite wide tuning now, right? 118 nanometers tuning, fairly good RIN. Um, 
below 155 at low temp low frequencies and at the residence peak it's upwards just above that and a very nice frequency spectrum right in this case with Lorentz in line with of under 100 hertz and i think we'll see this drop down to you know under 10 hertz in the future because again we can get much lower losses than we demonstrated in this particular laser so that's what's happened over, over the last 10 years we've now had this dramatic reduction in line widths over time and uh, i think this will continue um, Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, one can do even better with self-injection locking, and uh, uh, I'll talk about that. In particular, now we're using exclusively silicon nitride waveguides. So again, silicon waveguide loss is here. Low temperature silicon, sorry, silicon loss is, is, is here. Low temperature silicon nitride loss is here. But if you use high temperature silicon nitride you know, at the front end of the process, then you can get much lower losses down to 10th dB per meter. And uh, that's what allows one to get really the best results. And so here's a 200 millimeter wafer. And as you can see across this 200 millimeter wafer, we're getting, you know, cues of, of over 200 million across virtually the entire wafer with the exception of, of maybe one, one, one reticule or, or a few reticules in particular. So these are some fairly long waveguides in the center. These are 20 meter long uh, delay lines. Mostly we're using much smaller resonators, either 30 gigahertz or, or 5 gigahertz resonators. Um, and this shows the results. So now this is hybrid integrated. I'll show heterogeneous in a second. So it's just a DFB laser that is butt coupled to one of these high key resonators. And what you see here is here's the noise of the DFB laser. And uh, it's lined with this, you know, on the order of a, a megahertz. And as you couple it to this silicon nitride resonator, the noise goes down. In this case, it goes down by, say, you know, 40 dB um, for this fairly small cavity. It's, it's limited by the refractive noise. And as you go to longer and longer cavities, in this case, down to 135 megahertz free spectral range, the loss now gets, uh, the, the volume gets much larger, the refractive noise gets much smaller. And now you see a 70 dB reduction in the frequency noise of this laser. And uh, we see uh, if you look at the frequency noise comparison of this laser, which is shown here, to a good fiber laser, you see that, it, you know, at, at a megahertz, it's 20 dB smaller. And uh, so that's what's really exciting now, that we can now make highly integrated, uh, low-cost, small, very high-performance lasers. Um, the self-injection locking process... Uh, is very interesting and, and I think it's really important. So in the past, when we wanted to generate solitons, we had a laser shown here. We had an isolator to, to isolate that laser cavity from the, the resonator. And uh, uh, one's able to, with, with proper tuning of the frequency and power, get into these, these soliton states. And uh, you know, there's been a lot of work done at, at you know, lots of groups around the world uh, over the last 30 years. What we were doing now is to eliminate the isolator, and now the, the, the laser is, is coupled uh, directly to this ring resonator, and the backscatter from that, from that resonator uh, locks the laser to that cavity. And uh, it's that self-injection locking that pushes the noise down by, by 70 dB. You get into the soliton state every time. So that's what's shown here, that when you turn it on, it goes directly to it. You don't need to tune the frequency or the power. It goes directly into it, and, and that happens every time. And so you can make combs, single soliton, quiet combs at low frequencies, 20 gigahertz, at high frequencies, at terahertz. And uh, so the whole package for comb generation is now quite small. This is, again, heterogeneously integrated. Sorry, hybrid integrated. We'll show heterogeneous in a second. Um, that was with bright pulses. You can also do it with dark pulses. And uh, so again, with thinner silicon nitride, we can get uh, dark pulse generation. And again, uh, the same thing happens. So that's really, really very exciting. So I showed you know, 40 millihertz sorts of line widths, but that's nowhere close to where we can get to in the future. Um, we demonstrated silicon nitride waveguides at tower with 0.1 dB per meter loss. That means we should be able to get Lorentzian line widths down to a millihertz. And they might be external cavity based, 
but probably more likely, I think we, we find it works better to be self-injection lock based as shown here. So one thing I didn't mention is that uh, the lowest noise output occurs out of this uh, drop port over here because the, the noise out of this DFB laser is filtered by the resonator. Uh, you get slightly more noise coming out of the, the through port. And so the best results I've been showing are all out of the drop port. So Chao Zhang for his PhD thesis and uh, subsequent work as a, as a postdoc has been integrating these silicon nitride waveguides with the rest of the laser, again, uh, on a wafer scale process. So again, this is bonded 3.5 materials over silicon waveguide materials, waveguide materials. And uh, I'll show the next couple slides some results from that. One nice result is that since all of the, the laser waveguide is in silicon nitride, which has a very small thermoptic coefficient, they're very wavelength insensitive, about seven or eight times smaller than traditional silicon or, or gallium arsenide or any phosphide lasers. And that really eliminates the need for CWDM. Um, and so this shows the process of, of uh, integrating an extended cavity laser together with the self-injection lock ring resonator. And again, you see the, this reduction of you know, 20 or 30 dB in the uh, uh, frequency noise of the laser. Now, we only saw about 30 dB reduction here because there's only a single silicon nitride waveguide, and its cues were affected by the subsequent laser processing. So in a second, I'll show a better result where we get higher cues by having two layers of silicon nitride. However, that particular laser, so this is extended cavity uh, <clears throat> DBR laser coupled to a self-injection locked laser, we can now lock to a resonator made at, at Yale and at NIST. And uh, so this is a collaboration with uh, you know, Frank Quinlan and, and Scott Didams uh, and Peter Rakich at Yale, as well as Kerry Bahala's group. And uh, by locking them together, you can now get much greater reduction at low frequencies. So this shows the noise of the DFB laser. When you self-injection lock it, you see again, you know, 40 or 50 dB noise reduction. When you lock it to the cavity, you see as much at one hertz of 110 dB noise reduction. And uh, consequently, this laser, if you beat it, uh, appears to have a line width of about one hertz. We have several ways of measuring integrated line widths that all look to be about one hertz. And the Allen deviation looks very, very good, you know, below uh, 10 to minus 14, you know, out to one second, which is really, really very exciting. So, you know, this is what we want to integrate all together. And, uh, you know, Garrett's uh, crystal micro, uh, Solutions, uh, Crystal Micro Solutions Group is making very high Q resonators like this. And so I think we'll see from Thor Labs very nice, very narrow line with integrated lasers in the near future. If one wants to integrate that all together, this is the work that Chow has most recently done. We have two layers of silicon nitride. So one layer down here is buried, you know, three or four microns below the surface. So our subsequent laser processing does not degrade the Q. There's a redistribution layer, another silicon nitride layer up here. So the, the gain region, you know, again, heterogeneously integrated gain region couples to this first silicon nitride layer, and that couples to the second silicon nitride layer shown here. And uh, so I'll show these very recent results. They're very, very exciting. Um, one thing I, I didn't get into, but when you do self-injection locking, you have the laser, you have the, the backscatter from the resonator here, and uh, the phase of that matters. And so there are phases that are correct and give you, you know, in resonance and you get the noise reduction. Other cases you don't. And so you can see that in spades here where it's integrated. We just turn the power to that phase shifter. And you can see as you tune over, you know, two pi uh, here, um, you can see that. So there's regions here where the laser is locked. And, uh, and if you look, look, you know, across this region, it's very, very low noise. There are regions where it's chaotic and very noisy, and then uh, there's other regions where it's, it's free running. And uh, so all the behavior that you expect theoretically in Kerry Bahala's group has been predicting, uh, we, we see in spades. And uh, so again, this now shows uh, this now fully integrated self-injection locked laser. And uh, again, when it's, it's uh, uh, locked, the through port and, and drop port are about the same over most frequencies, but up here about you know 10 megahertz, you see a slight reduction. So the drop port is a little quieter. 
Um, this shows that first picture I showed, the science paper. So a few years ago, we were at noise levels up here. We've gone down by you know, 30 dB. And uh, so a lot of improvement by integration. Um, this last point is really important, that the self-injection lock lasers are very reflection insensitive. And that's shown here. So again, this is the same integrated chip. In the region where it's free running shown here, you see all this noise generated, even at reflection levels of minus 45 dB. However, when you injection lock it, it's insensitive to reflection noise up to about you know, minus 10 dB. And when you use the drop port, it's reflection insensitive at all levels of reflection. So even if we put 100% of the light going back into the chip, you don't see any variation. And that's what's shown here, that the frequency noise is basically the same for no reflection or minus 7 dB, which is just twice the coupling loss, basically. So here's the last example of what uh, Chao and Osama, uh, another member of my group, did recently. Two of these lasers are integrated together on the chip, and uh, uh, you can tune one past the other, and in this way generate microwave frequencies, in this case up to 50 gigahertz, obviously just limited by the, the bandwidth of the photo detector. This can be swept up to terahertz sorts of frequencies, and again with very low phase noise uh, across here. So. So all this work has been at primarily at 1.3 or 1.5 micron. We'd like to go into the visible. And uh, so Nexus Photonics in particular has been integrating gain regions with silicon nitride waveguides. And there's a whole host of applications uh, throughout the visible uh, if one can do this. And so that last picture was a wafer, one of the wafers they produced. And this is a picture of one of these same tunable lasers, what I just showed, two ring uh, tunable lasers. And what's exciting here now is that with integration, these lasers work actually quite high temperatures. It laces CW up to 185 degrees C, and even at a, you know, 150 degrees C, which is the highest temperature our, our line with measurement system would go, we, you know, we get very nice uh, side mode suppression and, and low frequency noise, uh, two kilohertz line widths, uh, even at high temperatures. We'd like to extend that into the visible, and this is the work that Ted Morin's doing in my group. And uh, so these are silicon nitride waveguides. They're very thin, just 24 nanometers thick. So all the energy is in the silicon oxide region. And uh, so again, the cues you can get with this are, are, are quite high, higher than, than most of the other technologies. Until you start to get below 300 nanometers, then you're better off, obviously, with uh, other technologies. We're doing some other work, a uh, collaboration with uh, uh, University of Rochester and with, and with uh, Caltech. So now, again, hybrid integrating gain regions with, with Piplin waveguides. And again, seeing all these same self-injection locked approaches I've just been talking about with Piplin and uh, getting narrow line widths. And now you get uh, you know, output uh, at twice the, the frequency you know, in, into the near infrared and the visible. One can make, in this way, a, a more complicated structure. So again, this is what we're calling an integrated hybrid laser integrate Puckel's cell laser. So again, you've got a gain region, you've got a phase shifter, you've got a frequency doubling Piplin region. And uh, again, this, this is the output coupler here. Uh, that's the other facet of this device. So you can resonate both at the, the lasing wavelength at 1500 and at the second harmonic wavelength at, at 790. And uh, this, because it's in lithium niobate, you can make a very linear frequency tuner. And I think this is a very interesting source for things like FMCW, uh, LiDAR applications. So um, I've been talking about comb generation uh, in silicon nitride. There's a lot of other ways to make combs. At first, I talked about using mode lock lasers. Uh, uh, there's also a variety of, of Kerr structures. And I want to talk in particular about using aluminum gallium arsenide now. And the reason we're focused on that is that Chi-2 and Chi-3 are very high. Uh, in, in gallium arsenide, much higher than you get with silicon nitride or silicon dioxide or lithium niobate. And uh, so this has a, a variety of applications then. Um, so again, we're heterogeneously integrated. We're, we're bonding aluminum gallium arsenide uh, waveguides to silicon uh, wafers. We etch off the substrate. So the aluminum gallium arsenide is entirely clad with SiO2. It gives you very high confinement and uh, with uh, you know, good control of, of sidewall roughness uh, with Wei Sheng Z worked on in my group, um, get very high cues uh, upwards of, of 3 million. 
You can then use that for second harmonic generation. And this is some work out of uh, Eric Stanton and Rich Mirren at NIST. And so again, they're doing wafer scale, you know, three inch wafer bonding of gallium arsenide onto silicon and getting very efficient second harmonic generation uh, out of it. You make very, very low power Kerr generation. And again, Lin Chang was working on that uh, in our group. And again, the, the high Qs you're getting, it's very high nonlinearity and the small area means the thresholds can be quite small. So you can see comb generation with just microwatts of pump power, you know, whereas in the past one would use, you know, say 100 milliwatts. Um, it has been difficult to generate quiet single solitons with Algas because the thermooptic coefficient is large. If you cool it down, then the thermooptic coefficient becomes similar to SiO2, and then you can make stable single solitons. More recently, Kerry Valhalla's group has been uh, making single solitons at, at room temperature, and Lin Cheng has been making dark solitons because now the sign is flipped, right? And you can make a very stable dark pulse generation uh, with a very wide tuning range. And uh, it's very exciting work. And, and Lin has been uh, demonstrating this for a variety of applications. Uh, I'll show one example, which is here, which is generating a comb. So again, I showed this at the very beginning, but it's a DFB pumped algas comb source. And you can see the comb here looks very, very nice. It pumps an array of, of modulators across here. And uh, in this case, generating you know, two terabits of data. And so uh, it's a very exciting, very efficient uh, comb source. Um, so what I've talked about is, is basically integrated tunable lasers and comb sources. And we've gone from in the past, you know, where one would have very big systems using lots of Thor Labs equipment, admittedly, um, to uh, generate solitons. It's now things that are integrated together. In this case, 15 gigahertz or terahertz, but they're just simple little butterfly packages uh, to do that. And similarly with going from you know, expensive tunable lasers to now uh, uh, packaged lasers uh, at a variety of wavelengths from you know, two microns to as short as, as 400 nanometers. And again, they can have very, very narrow line widths and yet be quite tunable. So summary of all this work is there really is a silicon photonics revolution happening, you know, by you know, 100 groups around the world and lots of companies, lots of academic aspects. And if you look at the number of components integrated on a waveguide, as shown here, uh, on, on native substrates, it has gone up rapidly over the years. But now there's much, much more progress on silicon, right? So this is uh, Ming Wu's group on, on making, you know, very large optical switches, you know, with hundreds of thousands of, of switches elements integrated together. And then this is all the work on heterogeneous integration and uh, a group of basically all these companies that are really looking at the electronics I talked about first, namely, you know, co-packaged optics in particular. So companies like Cisco and Broadcom and, and Intel uh, doing that. Um, so as shown here, typically heterogeneous and lags hybrid by a couple of years, but ultimately it has, I think, the better reliability lower cost and, and higher density. Um, so I want to thank my group for uh, all their contributions shown here. Uh, I get to talk about all this, but this, all those results were a lot of long hours in the lab, and I really appreciate their efforts. So Garrett, I'd love to take questions at this point. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, sorry, got to get my camera back on. <laughs> so thanks for that very nice and informative presentation. Um, again, keep submitting questions, and now I'll start reading what we have uh, so far. Um, I'm going to go to the bottom. There's a couple questions about the uh, multi-ring uh, stabilized lasers. So one was, uh, can an external cavity tunable ring laser be operated sort of akin to a DFB laser? So could you operate with a fixed single mode wavelength, and can that be tuned without mode hopping? So the maximum distance you can tune it is, you know, about a nanometer, a few nanometers, perhaps. Um, these structures, the longer you make the cavity, the closer, the, the, the smaller the continuous tuning range is. So you need, in general, to make the, the rings closer together, the gain region shorter, the phase tuner shorter. That gives you the maximum continuous tuning range. So we're limited to a full tuning range of, of 120 nanometers, limited by the gain of the semiconductor. Um, 
but then within that, there's, you know, say 20 mode hops within that, right? So it's tuning maybe a nanometer, sorry, 200 mode hops um, yeah. at a time. Uh, and the mode hop free range is nanometer ish? Yes, exactly. That's right. Yeah. But yeah, you can leave it, you know, locked in that for, you know, years at a time. Yeah. And then a related question I'll jump up to is um, again, in a three ring cavity, is there any challenges in aligning all three rings, um, like biasing the rings to, in a repeatable way, reach the wavelength you want? Is it is are there control challenges? I guess in that system. Yes, there are. But the nice thing about this, and so we do this all the time, is we include monitor photodiodes on here, so you can look at the power in each of the three rings. You can look at the output power out of the two sides of the cavity, and again, these could be you know like half percent or even tenth percent taps. And so it doesn't really take much power out of it, but it allows you to see what's going on within the laser cavity and you can see where the rings are. And so um, as I showed that Intel commercial chip, they've got lots of uh, internal monitor photodiodes on there that you know, tap just a, a percent of power at most. And uh, you can see in a, you know, like, like a 3.2 terabit transceiver, you know, there's probably 32 lasers in there, right? And so you can see what all 32 lasers are doing. And perhaps you might put in spares, right? It, it's a you know, common thought mm -hmm. is to have 33 lasers there. And if one fails, then you just uh, use a different one. And uh, so you get an extra element of reliability by having that redundancy. And I think that's what will happen in general. So in general, the whole advantage of, of integration is the fact that you can have a lot of monitors that, that uh, let you know what's going on in the cavity. Um, yeah, very nice. And then continuing on that theme <laughs> with the uh, these um, you know integrated systems with the the ring resonator stabilized version, um, what would you expect the footprint to be if you were to add say like integrated circulators, isolators? What the final chip size you would expect for a say discrete element that's the laser itself? So the reason I like quantum dots and the reason I like self-injection locking is they're reflection sensitive and you typically don't need an isolator. Um, partially because it's difficult to integrate an isolator. So it can be done and, and Paulo and, and Tony Diwani and my group have been working on integrated isolators for the last you know 10 years. Uh, but the, they tend to be large, they tend to require a magnet, uh, which is bulky. It tends to go against what we're, you know, dense, high volume manufacturing. So I prefer yeah. quantum dots to having isolate, you know, magnetic materials in it. But there are a lot of interesting applications when one does include magnetics, you know, crystal optic transducers and things like that, that could be done. So um, that's all possible. But, but I, you know, if you look like it today, what Luxterra now Cisco uh, has done with isolators between their laser and their pick, you kind of lose all the advantages of silicon photonics. It's, it's bulky, it's, you can't do self-testing. I mean, the nice thing I didn't get into is that like these transceivers, a 3.2 terabit transceiver is fully self-tested on wafer before you dice it up, before you do anything else. That can only happen if the laser is integrated. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's really the, the value, I think. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, and now we're going to switch topics. So uh, nice question about moving to shorter wavelengths. So you mentioned, you know, integration of nitrides going towards like the uh, far end of the visible, say, blue uh, range. Do you see uh, manufacturing challenges for specific wavelengths like blue, green, red? What, in your opinion, is the most difficult uh, wavelength to achieve in an integrated fashion? Well, I think, you know, gallium nitride has been more difficult to integrate than gallium arsenide or indium phosphide because indium phosphide and gallium arsenide tend to be much more flat. And so when you bond it, the bonding occurs very, you know, is very good. Uh, mm -hmm. But the roughness you get in a typical gallium nitride wafer ends up being a bit of a problem. But obviously gallium nitride gives very good blue lasers Getting green is more difficult. Yellow is more difficult as you get more indium in those structures. But again, they're making tremendous progress. So, you know, obviously what Steve Denbars and uh, the, the group at uh, Nakamura's group at, at UCSB and, and elsewhere around the world, Sandia, everywhere, 
is really making tremendous, tremendous progress there. So I think we will see heterogeneously integrated throughout the visible and uh, at, you know, for red wavelengths and near infrared, it'll be gallium arsenide based and shorter than that, it'll be gallium nitride based. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, it's more of a material maturity issue, right? With the nitrides versus the arsenides. Agreed. And so on. And then one other comment is that the, it's a little challenging as you get into the blue and violet because, you know, the nitride, if it's pure nitride is very thin, you know, 24 nanometers is needed to get all the energy into the oxide rather than in the nitride. And uh, doing that reproducibly across wafers is a challenge as well. So that, that's a good comment. Yeah. Um, now switching to the quantum dot topic. Um, can you comment further on the, what sets the ultimate limits for the reliability in the quantum dot structures? Is it inherent to the, the epitaxial material itself? Or is it, um, yeah, uh, is it okay. driven, driven by some sort of thermal mismatch? Any additional details on what limits the uh, lifetime of the quantum dot structures? So, you know, Bob Herrick's been a, a world expert at, at laser reliability in a variety of structures, from Vixels to, uh, to silicon photonics. And uh, he recently wrote a book, or I mean, he edited a book, which I recommend if you want, and he wants to really understand laser reliability. Um, but it's all about defects and dislocations, right? So things like gallium arsenide are well known. Dark line defect growth is well understood. Um, you have to eliminate the defects. And... Uh, or in the case of gallium arsenide waveguides, it's the facet, right? So you get the, the fat recombination of the facet causes damage, which then propagates, you know, destroys the whole laser in this thermal runaway problem. The big advantage of silicon photonics, if you look at like the work that Nexus is doing, the, there's no exposed gallium arsenide, right? It's, there's exposed silicon or silicon dioxide or silicon nitride waveguide, but there's no gallium arsenide facet there. It's all buried within this oxide layer. Same thing is true for Intel's heterogeneously integrated lasers at, at 1.5 or 1.3, that uh, there's no exposed 3.5. So the reliability is actually quite good. And as I mentioned, um, you know, some of the work that's come out, uh, it's like 20 times more reliable than native substrate. And, you know, we never really thought we would get better. We were just trying to get as good. Um, so the striking thing about quantum dots is that the high indium content basically freezes the dislocations and they don't move, they don't propagate. And so that's what led to the final improvement, which was led by you know, Eamon Hughes and uh, Kunal Mukherjee and uh, Jenny Selvage, which is understanding that, that as you, after you grow it, as you cool it down, the, the threading dislocations are, are frozen in the active layer. And so you have to you have to include blocking layers, and that's what those papers referenced in there. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll send these slides to anyone who wants them. Uh, all the references are there. But that you have to get the blocking layers there to prevent misfits from being in the active layer. So it's all about threading dislocations, misfit dislocations. But as you can see there, we're, we're now about 200,000 hours or more at 80 degrees C. I'm convinced we'll get a million hours before long, and that's really what Eamon's focus is uh, at the moment. So. All right, and then switching gears one more time, um, on the optical gyroscope uh, performance, do you see um, challenges in reaching MEMS gyroscope levels of performance, or is it already there? Um, yeah, what sort of work needs to be done in that space? Yeah, I think you know the the best work there is going on at you know places like Honeywell and Northrop and Anello Photonics, and. Uh, you know, the, the goal is certainly to get an integrated fiber gyroscope, right? So to get beyond the MEMS performance and get to really the very best fiber gyroscope performance. And, uh, you know, our losses in nitride waveguides are still far above optical fiber. And, and the other big problem is that, you know, the sensitivity of gyroscope, it's the enclosed area. So you really, it's pushing you to get large substrates and that's what fiber excels at. But Yes, I'm, I'm pretty confident that, you know, we will see continued progress in integrated waveguide gyroscopes, and they'll certainly, I think, replace a lot of the gyroscopes in, in, in use today. I'm not sure we'll ever exceed the best fiber gyroscopes, fog gyroscopes, but um, 
But again, you know, there's a lot of work in the inter interferometric fiber optic gyroscope, but also then the uh, resonator-based ones, right? So our fogs. And uh, so again, these high key resonators with these narrow line with lasers make a very nice R fog. And uh, again, if you're using nitride, you don't have two photon absorption and the issues you have with silicon. And so, I, I, yeah, I think it's really, really exciting. Okay, let's do two more questions if you <laughs> sure. bear, bear with us here. So uh, interesting question, switching totally opposite end of the spectrum from the visible lasers. Um, yeah, can you comment on work with integrating longer wavelength sources, like pushing into the mid infrared, say three, four microns and beyond, uh, in terms of integrated um, devices? So, you know, we've worked with uh, NRL. So, this is work, you know, Alex Spot did at UCSB and now he's at Mirios and uh, integrating interband cascade lasers, you know, the three micron range on silicon or quantum cascade lasers at four microns or longer on silicon. And, uh, there are some advantages, you know, the high thermal conductivity of silicon is a big advantage. You know, we take advantage of that now with, with all our other structures, but certainly in the infrared, that's true as well. Um, the difficulty typically has been coupling, say the quantum cascade laser to waveguides and, and getting the full pick, the full sensor. But I think there is, a, you know, that that is a great application of, you know, making two micron, two and a half micron, or, you know, other longer wavelength sensors for methane and, and a variety of greenhouse gases. So, um, and again, you know, it's basically a spectrometer, right? If you have a tunable laser, like I showed with a detector and, and a, a cell in between or a propagation in between, that you basically have an integrated spectrometer. And I think that allow us to have sort of ubiquitous sensing of, of, of uh, greenhouse gases. And so, yeah, I think it's pretty exciting. All right, final question. So this is more of an open-ended one, but uh, can you give some comments on where you see future directions? Um, you know, would this be more exploring exotic materials for accessing different wavelengths? Would it be operating in different environments, say cryogenic operation or otherwise? But just curious to hear where you see the exciting directions to go from here. So, I mean, certainly cryogenic is very exciting. I mean, it, it makes no sense to have microwave transmission lines going from room temperature down to some quantum computer, it, uh, that's, just, that's just nonsense, right? So we can have low, lo low power modulators at cryogenic temperatures. And there's a, a you know, summer topical conference on that this summer in, in Italy, um, and a lot of progress in that area. So I think that will be transformed. And so uh, that's certainly a very exciting direction. I think the general quantum computing direction is exciting. So, I showed the aluminum gallium arsenide resonator work that, you know, Josh and Trevor and Lynn are doing in my group, but uh, you know, Galen Moody's group is is using that now for photon entanglement and and quantum key distribution and quantum uh, computing, and that's really exciting. And so, uh, again, you know, it's one thing to do it with discrete devices to really make that work. You need to really have it all integrated together. And that's where the whole silicon photonics field is going. So I didn't really get into the platforms, but you know, obviously, you know, tower semiconductor is a, is a great silicon photonics platform, uh, very re relatively inexpensive. They run lots of multi-project wafers, and with you know, quintessence and open light, there are multi-project wafers going with integrated lasers. That's exciting. Uh, AIM is doing that with, uh, again, we're collaborating with them with quantum dot epitaxial material. Um, IMEC is doing it, uh, and, and lots of groups in Singapore and China. So there's, you know, the exciting thing is you don't have to be experts in fab anymore, right? You have to be expert in design and doing and doing layout, but uh, and you have to be patient, right? You know, sometimes maybe nine months until you get a chip back, but <laughs> which is a problem for getting PhD theses out in a in a good time time frame. But uh, I think we're just going to keep exploding. Yeah. Very nice. Again, very much appreciate the time. Thank you for that uh, very informative, very exciting presentation. And thank you everyone for attending, uh, contributing questions. Um, and yeah, let's thank Professor Bowers for that, uh, that uh, those very nice slides. I wanna give a quick just note about an upcoming uh, webinar. So on April 26th, we'll have a webinar on workforce development, and that's gonna be presented by our very own uh, Navid Antizarian from Thor Labs. And uh, you should be able to register for this event soon at thorlabs.com slash webinars. 
So again, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for your time and attendance, and we hope to see you again in the future.